there's a part of him that's a real pioneer to plunge into the depths of the depravity that was in Lower East Side at that time. Prostitution and murder was commonplace. He, he, he was on some kind of tightrope. So I have been doing a series of podcast interviews face to face and all over, uh, also over Zoom over the past few weeks and the past few months. Um, this is basically to talk about the art market, talk about the culture, talk about the reasons why certain individuals or artists became artists in the first place, or their dealers or promoters or affiliates to, to this space. And what we're trying to do as as Woodbury House as a brand is create this ecosystem because we are known as, you know, um, an organisation that have dealt with Richard Hamilton Artworks since 2014. And there's been a few key people that have been pushing the market. And the next person I'm about to speak to is certainly someone that I admire, someone that I definitely respect. Uh, I met only once in London when you came over to our studio. Uh, and also someone that is featured on the Shadow Man docu- documentary, along with your father, Rick Labrizzi, who is also a, a very iconic man. So introducing Nemo Labrizzi, thank you for your time and thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Steve. It's my pleasure. Now, I, I didn't really know how to introduce you. Um, I know, you know, when you read about you on, on the internet, some people refer to you as a graffiti artist. And when I had a conversation with you, um, you, you were very much an, a, 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 an artist back in the day. But now times have obviously evolved. Um, when I last, um, we were having lunch at, I think, um, a restaurant in Mayfield with Andy Van Warbida. And um, I think you said to me that you, you were fe- considering back then picking up the paintbrush again and doing some more artwork. So have you reignited that passion or is it something you've kept to a side? Yeah, I mean, I've always, I guess the way to introduce me, the, the word that I, uh, <laughs> my preferred nomenclature would be bohemian. And that I've always made some kind of art or writing or, I, I've also made a lot of radio shows and did um, little films. But I also, Steve, as you know, like working with artists on the back, you know, uh, behind the scenes. So anything creative, artistic, or culturally meaningful, you could count me in. Yeah. Um, the, the the One of the main, main reasons that, you know, we're speaking right now. One of the main reasons that I got to know you and also that you came to the studio, I think the thing that brought, brought everybody together is because of specifically the Richard Hamilton market. I mean, we spoke about other artists and obviously there's so many thriving artists who are who are alive today. But um, quite naturally, you know, Richard Hamilton has always been, you know, hot topic and, you know, someone that has been admired in the street art community. And at the end of the day, he's known as the godfather of street art, coined by the New York Times. So tell me a bit about your relationship with Richard back in the day, because I know your dad, Rick, had a good relationship with him. Um, I know you had a good relationship with him. And you also had a good relationship with, with other artists, such as Keith Herring, for example. I think I remember you mm-hmm. telling me that Keith Herring actually said that Nemo Labrizzi was probably one of the most favorite artists that he used to uh, watch in a mine and collect. Well, um, okay, so your first question, uh, kind of the, the quick uh, route to explaining our involvement with Richard is that I was a graffiti artist before it kind of became uh, mainstream art and um, at the time, the best place for graffiti art, the meeting place for graffiti artists, and one of the definitely the first place I saw um, John Michel's work and, and Keith's work and met the men that were making all this work was the Fun Gallery on the Lower East Side. And at the time, I was, I don't know, nine years old, 10 years old, 11 years old. My dad used to have to bring me to openings there because we lived out in Queens at the time. So he would kind of bring me there and drop me off with all the graffiti artists and with Patty Astor to look after me. And he would wander off into the East Village scene. So he got an idea of who, who he liked over there, what was happening in the East Village and which artists he wanted to collect. And when he first saw Richard's work, he fell in love and he couldn't get his hands on anything that Richard had made. At the time, Richard had even, from what I understand, 
he wouldn't even sell Gagosian one. So uh, finally, like fast forward, I don't know, about 10 years. And Richard had, you know, fallen out of the limelight and gone back into sort of his hermetic lifestyle. And he came up to my dad on the street to sell him a painting just, you know, out in the open street. So my dad bought a painting from him and he said, oh, let me see what else you got. And they went back to his studio and he realized for all those years, Richard had been painting, but it hadn't really had a, an outlet for all this work. So <clears throat> my dad sort of became a unofficial manager or a private dealer for Richard. And uh, for many years, maybe a good 10 years, my dad dealt with Richard exclusively. And then at some point they had a falling out and then Richard would start calling me. Hey Nemo, I, you know, I, I, I got some really beautiful things I'd like to sell. Can you help me out? So anybody I knew that had two nickels to rub together, I would bring them down there, whether it's a fashion model or actor friends. And I started doing the same sort of thing my dad was doing until at which point, my dad introduced me to Andy and said, we got to bring Andy Val Morbida down to Richard's studio. And Andy had some ideas for some art shows he'd wanted to do downtown. But when he saw Richard, he just, he, you know, like most of us, he just became very enthusiastic about Richard's work. And he said, <clears throat> you know, I want to get behind this. I want to put everything behind Richard because this is a, a living legend. And, um, from that point on till today, I think, and your your efforts as well have helped us bring Richard to where he's back to being like a household name. Yeah, for sure. How was the connection? Because I've never known this between Andy and also your dad Rick Labrizi. How 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 did they know each other? Through Vito Schnabel, <clears throat> I believe that's how they first met. Um, you know, Julian was sort of a sec it was always a second father for me growing up, Julian Schnabel. And then, um, you know, I met Vito, he must have been 10 years old. So we're all one big family. So when Vito started dealing art, uh, he would sometimes go with my dad over to Tom Wesselman's studio, et cetera, or to Richard Hamilton's studio. And um, when Andy first came to New York, or to stay long term, uh, Vito made sure that my dad and Andy got to know each other. But my dad said to me, you know, Nemo, I'm not out on the street the way I used to be. He said, I feel like you and Andy would be a lot better to connect and put him in touch with whatever's going on in New York today. Yeah. So when I, when I got approached, you know, via Andy um, back in 2014 and he said look I think you know you could do something here with the Richard Hamilton market and promoting his work and essentially becoming an art dealer um, it was quite easy for me to trans you know transfer my concentration and my skill set my mindset into his market because he showed me the Shadow Man documentary trailer about seven minutes long, you were on there, your dad was on there, Andy was on there. It was such a compelling story. And I think to get a narrative and a message and a point of view across in seven minutes, that trailer done it all for me. I fell in love with it. So much so, my, me and my father end up buying a piece of Shadowhead, which I still got today, which is really, really cool. And you've got social media and you also got the internet. But back in the day, there was no trailer to a movie. There was no social media. There wasn't even really the internet. So how did your dad, because that's a skill in itself, how did he have the inclination to know that Richard Hamilton is going to be a household name or certainly someone for the mass market or big collectors to, uh, to stockpile? Well, uh, the way my father would explain it, if he were here, is that you know art history has always been the passing of a torch from one generation to the next and a lot of artists that we could consider great artists today are actually in some regard outsider artists that they don't figure into art history in any significant way they're just expressing their own selves but it doesn't tie in with the trajectory or the story that has been passed down 
from even ancient times back to Egypt. And my father recognized that Richard Hamilton is actually, in some regard, a conclusion to a Jackson Pollock because Jackson Pollock had been part of the abstract expressionist innovators who tried to liberate painting from representation. So at what point Jack, Jackson Pollock did the, the drip paintings, they were completely non-representationally abstract. At some point later in life, he decided to return that gesture to the figure and was generally regarded as having failed at this. People didn't like the work and he ended up very shortly after killing himself, though it was an accident. Where Richard somehow was able to piece together a representational reality, but using all of those abstract, spontaneous strokes that were brought to bear by the abstract expressionist movement. So you could see a direct line from Picasso to Pollock, from Pollock to Hamilton. And you can't say that for too many artists that are working out there today. So I think it was simple, I'll call it mathematics. If, if art history is in any regard a hard science, Richard Hamilton has all of the uh, criterion to be that next person uh, in that trajectory. Yeah, I like the way you described that. And it's a bit like my mission here with doing the podcast in an interview in. So I'll tell you what I mean. I'm not from per se the art market, okay? Right place, right time, fell in love with the, the, the narrative and the story, and I wanted to contribute towards this market. And when I set up my podcast three years ago, it was actually to interview like entrepreneurs, athletes. I do a bit of boxing as well, Nemo. You can probably see the black eye I've got right right now. And I, I like interviewing, you know, the entrepreneurs, the fighters, because I just love the mindset. But I started interviewing a few artists. Number one, because I'm in, you know, I'm interested in art itself. Two, I, I do like the New York kind of artists that I've got. Bit of a checkered background. I think that's quite interesting. Bit like Hamilton. It factors in towards their work. Um, but I start realizing, just like you're saying, there's there's some dots that are connected. So I'll, I'll give you quite an obvious one. Hamilton for me is quite naturally linked to Basquiat and and Herring, and even though they've got different styles, it's been uh, publicized so many times in different uh, publications, such as the International Herald Tribune, where they were painting together back in the 80s. And there's loads of different you know conversations in and around that. But when I start looking at Basquiat and also Herring, I also noticed there were two other guys that didn't really get as much limelight as Basket and Herring. So one of them was LA2, uh, Mr. Uh, Ortiz. Um, he used to be painting partners and uh, an affiliate to Keith Herring. Some say the reason why Keith Herring, and you might be able to verify this, got to the streets is because, you know, um, he used a, uh, uh, LA2 as a bit of a gateway because he was respected and he knew he knew the streets he knew the people around there so it gave him a bit of a bit of a green pass to go down there and do, do his thing and Jean-Michel Basquiat used to go by the the, the tag name Samo and when I started researching Samo I realized there was another guy called Al Diaz who used to go by the name Samo as well and then I started looking at Richard Hamilton's uh, old kind of friendship group there was a tenant um, a guy called Christopher Ellis goes by the name Days he was his tenant then you've got a paint, uh, painting affiliate to him which is Crash then that goes on to Risk and then that guy you know and then before I know it I I'm interviewing all these people you know in the ecosystem and they've all got different styles they've all got great stories and I believe maybe that, that they won't all financially hit the same heights as the Keith Harrings the Richard Hamiltons, the Jean-Michel Basquiat's, but surely over time, most of them are going to go up in value from an investment point of view. Would you would you agree with that that statement, Nemo? Well, yeah, I think that um, what I'll go ahead and shamelessly call graffiti has yet to take its proper place in the canon of art history. I think it. I'll maintain that it was the most important movement of the 80s. It was just that it was a popular movement, meaning a people's movement, uh, mainly from 
ghetto kids that didn't go to any, you, you know, arts college. And uh, a lot of them were black and brown people who have been marginalized from mainstream representation. So you, you definitely brought up some excellent examples. If you say LA2 and Al Diaz, um, both of whom are people without whom we wouldn't have had the graffiti phenomenon as such that later morphed into what I guess we call street art today. And some people even issue that, that title as street art as a, a slur. But um, LA2, for instance, I mean, you know, we knew each other from those days. And uh, I remember when Keith would have borders in his paintings, LA would um, fill them in with his tags and his little uh meanders his little doodles and uh i remember seeing them and thinking wow what would happen if those doodles weren't there it would be an altogether different picture it wouldn't have that kinetic energy and i don't know if if angel and keith had fought at one point but one time i went to a show where these borders were now filled in by keith with sort of similar markings but they didn't have the dynamism. And I had to say, wow, it, it, it's just a per perfect partnership. It's like, a, you know, a jazz ensemble or something. So Angel LA2 is a piece of history and whether he makes artwork that's worth as much or whatever, he could never be ignored from that history. So a smart investor that wanted to really have the story told by on their walls, would obviously want to include something by him and also Al Diaz, who was, uh, you know, really a leader in the, the same old project, which got Jean-Michel, you know, off the ground. Because in the same way, uh, Keith was coming from Pennsylvania and he was, you know, a little bit effeminate at a time when New York was a very macho place. Um, Jean-Michel was upper middle class. So he didn't come from the projects in the streets. And Al Diaz was very much a part of that graffiti art subway movement. So he was kind of a guide for Jean-Michel as well, even though Jean-Michel is inner city and he's a so-called black person, it's still, he wasn't necessarily an insider. As well, he used to hang around with um, uh, Ram Al Z's uh, um, students who were A1 and core and toxic so you know everybody at that time you could barely walk the street without having a connection to someone that was well represented in the street so you're right to say that that you, you really wouldn't have one without the other mm. and um so you know knowing knowing street art graffiti and also being a an ex-graffiti artist yourself how have you seen the landscape change from like 70s, 80s, 90s and to, to where we are today? Has it changed dramatically in your opinion or is it still the kind of same, you know, vibe as it was back then? Um, well, I, I recently was asked by Chase Contemporary to write a, uh, a little piece for their Hamilton um, catalog for a show that's hanging now. And... I, I quoted Henry Miller in saying, in the street is where things are real or where they're true. I forget the exact quote, but I recently spoke with one of our popular so-called street artists. And I love the guy's work, but I mentioned the word, you know, street cred. And he goes, yeah, street cred in a metro card will get me on the subway. What is to say, it's not meaningful to him. And at one time, you really had to prove yourself on the street in order to be taken seriously in our art world, which was really a very democratic place. Now everything's global and international. Anybody can just come up with some narrative, make a Wikipedia page for themselves that anyone will believe. And these person need not have mm. proved themselves in the same way that the graffiti artists and the street artists of those first generations did. Because, you know, you could be beaten up, you could be robbed, and certainly if people didn't like what you were doing, they would paint right over it. They would disrespect you. So in order for Keith and Jean-Michel and Richard Hamilton to be respected, 
it was like what, what jazz musicians used to be called the cutting contest, where you'd get up there with your saxophone and you would play against other saxophone players. And if people didn't appreciate what you were doing, you'd be booed off the stage and you'd either go home and practice more or you'd sell your horn. And now I think it's very easy for people to go right from sort of a college setting and be funneled right into the art world, where before I think there was this proving ground of the public that you had to get through that I think was an excellent filter. And I think the people who made it through this filter, Steve, are still here today. And I wonder about some of the people that are proving themselves this easier route today, whether they'll be at the bottom of the birdcage tomorrow. Yeah. You said a couple of important things there. So I'm going to hit one of them, which is like proving yourself. So on the Shadowman uh, documentary, and also quite similar to uh, the Radiant Child, which is Jean-Michel Basquiat's, <clears throat> there's quite a lot of reference in, in both of these documentaries uh, about New York back in the 70s and 80s, where there was a lot of crime from drugs, prostitution, shooting, stabbings, gang members, uh, graffiti. Because yeah. let's remember, even though this is a genre now, graffiti, street art, and now contemporary street art or urban, that people call it now, it was actually crime back in the day. So, yeah. So... I know some of these documentaries, they make it sound glamorous and it makes it sound interesting and it's, it makes it sound exciting. But talk to me about the reality of it. I mean, was it such a danger, war zone, like hostile place back then or has it been over-exaggerated? Well, put it this way. Uh, although my father came up rough, by the time I was a child, he would pretty much made it and and... I wasn't exactly born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but I had a cushion between me and the harsh reality of the streets. And in beginning to write graffiti, which was just sort of a cool thing to do when I was eight, nine, and 10 years old, I was now exposed to the world of the streets. And actually the worst ghettos were um, meccas for graffiti artists for a number of reasons. And so I went from being kind of a sheltered, or even spoiled kid to getting a good dose of the street realities from a young age. And I can tell you countless times, Steve, I, I had my life in my hands without, without being dramatic. I, there were times I could have been killed. I mean, one time there was another uh, kind of hippie uh, Caucasian graffiti artist that was up in the subway tunnels and got stabbed and left for dead. I, I think it was pretty much a robbery. He's a good kid. He's a friend of mine. Um, luckily, he survived, and, and he went and became a very strong creative force for this world, too. But the guy who stabbed him some weeks later, I found myself in the same subway tunnel as this guy. And they were all smoking angel dusts, which can drive anyone mad. And we were in total darkness in a tunnel where there's no police, no potential witnesses or whatever. I said, well, my life isn't worth five cents right now if this guy just decides to flip. So at some point, I don't know what happened to me. I, I think I just sort of snapped and I stopped worrying about the risks because I understood that what I wanted more than anything was to get my name up on the trains and I was ready for whatever came with it. Same way, Steve, in those days, if you wanted to see Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh or if you wanted to see rock cam you had to go to some pretty dicey places where people would be like oh i'm not going over there people get shot i said well i'm not going over there to get shot i'm going over there to hear the music and luckily i went in and out of all those concerts and in and out of all those train yards pretty much unscathed but it definitely put some hair on my chest and for any of those people keith herring jean michel or richard hamilton they were confronted again and again and again and again with that street reality. And it's only their creativity and their strong urge to create something that they withstood all of that adversity. And it, yeah, it was a real force that would have scared anybody else away if they weren't serious. I mean, uh, uh, this highlights the um, a part of Hamilton's kind of, <laughs> narrative and some of his uh different artworks and what i'm trying to get to and the point i'm trying to raise is this 
the crime and let's say the deaths, the stabbings, the shootings, the gangs, he used to do these mass murder scenes. Um, right. We actually uh, duplicated one. We got someone from Christie's to come down as a bit of fun, uh, pull it into the studio on the floor. So, you know, clients would come in and, and we could talk about it. We could talk about this was the birth of when Hamilton used to paint. He used to recreate these mass murder scenes. And they highlight that in the documentary. Did you ever see them, uh, Hamilton ones? You know, were they, did you ever witness him doing them all the time? And Oh, I, no, I, he'd, he'd done them before I'd ever met them, but I certainly saw them on the street. And it, it was true at the time you would see people. You know, I saw people shot for damn near nothing on the street. And I remember at one time, just to tie it in, I, I was standing on the corner and there were two drug dealers on the other corner and one of them shot the other one. Another guy fell down and the guy with the gun ran and an ambulance happened to pull up right next to me at that moment. So Steve, I was like, I said to the ER I said, uh, worker, I said, hey, excuse me, um, somebody just got shot there. And the paramedic said, somebody got shot? Oh my God. And I said, well, this guy sees it every day and he's more excited about it than me. I guess I must have become somewhere along the line a little bit numb to this reality. And, and also bear in mind, it wasn't just the hip hop street guys, the, the, you know, the inner city. It was also um, the mafia at the time. There were a lot of mafia wars and people being killed on the street. So, you know, people were a lot more in touch with that. Um, you know, you might be here today and gone tomorrow in those times. Now everybody's kind of shopping and they're waiting in line for hours to buy the latest launch at this store or that store. In those days, we didn't feel like we might make it through the, the evening or to see the next day. I think everybody was kind of pressed up against those considerations, that reflections on our mortality. So, of course, it became part of Richard's work. And even those shadows are sort of on one hand sentinels. On one hand, they're like spirits or ghosts of the departed. So it, it's always he's always embraced that darker side of the streets, which I've learned to really love and it's become a part of my heart. Whereas when I was younger, maybe it even frightened me. I think a lot of people it frightened. Yeah. Um, so just on the last point of like, you know, people earning their stripes. So it's, it's quite known that, you know, people in music, you know, rap or hip hop, certainly back then, um, maybe even some sports athletes, maybe, you know, drug dealers or graffiti artists. It was a bit of a melting pot and people used to oscillate between a few of them. They used to segue into others. You know, they used to, there was a bit of cross pollination. They used to influence. There was this whole culture. Um, I interviewed a guy called Mike Melbourne. I think you know him. Uh, yeah, I know him very well. Frank Chop Shop, really, really cool guy. And I got a lot of good, mm -hmm. uh, valuable uh, insight to, you know, that kind of scene. And he said that my barber shop, Frank Chop Shop, yeah, it's there to cut people's hair and stuff. But really and truly, it's a melting pot of like creativity. It's like a networking environment. Yeah, and, it is. And he said it's very much, that's how the streets of New York used to be like. But now, you know, talking about earning your stripes, people used to, you know, fight had their lives maybe, um, you know, put on the line sometimes. They used to be arrested, used to go to jail, all that kind of stuff. Um, but now, like you said, people can make a fake um, Wikipedia page. They can come up with a social social media sort of brand. They can have these Facebook pages, et cetera, and pump a bit of money behind it. And before you know it, they become a bill of, a, a bill of somebody and they're not really authentic. So would you say social media is really kind of, been a hindrance to the industry or has it actually been a good way good thing in, in some I, ways it, yeah i think it's its own reality and i think that you know for instance i've sat next to a woman in a restaurant and looked at her and said well wow, that woman's beautiful and if i saw her on instagram i might really dream about who she is but watching her move and say, i'm not I, I don't have that physical attraction that comes naturally. So I think uh, everyone is able to be like what Warhol said, famous for 15 minutes now. And I think it's beautiful. And I think that you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. I think the people that are out there, you know, uh, maintaining some sort of uh, role, people see through that. And people will be exposed. 
like Mike Malvin, uh, I didn't know him. He wasn't around in the uh, 80s. I think he came to New York in the 90s at some point. But right away, he got involved with every strata of society, which is, to me, that's the real New York. Like, I grew up with guys who are billionaires now uh, from their own hard work, and I grew up with guys that are just coming home from 25 years in jail for murder. And I treat them all the same. They're just my friends. But, yeah, that's New York for you. And, and Mike is one of the last of the Mohicans, and his barbershop is a place I always drop by if I'm in the area, or sometimes I'll detour to be in the area just so I can see who's hanging around. And I don't know if you know, he has a fishing club now. So um, that's exactly it, that this new world, it's, it's more about people who've created some sort of establishment for themselves, and that thriving street culture just doesn't exist anymore. I mean, I go to one party here called Fire Sunday. Um, it's, it's by um, Bobby Condors and Jabba. It's basically a dance hall party, but it's, it's in Bed Bedford-Stuyvesant in an old school club. And that's the one place I can bring somebody visiting New York and saying, this is the real New York. And yeah, a lot of people in there are somebody you don't want to step on their toe. But at the same time, if you came there to party and have a good time, people will not try to intimidate you, they'll, they'll make you feel comfortable. And that's really the old school New York where we all shared one common culture. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> you know, I see, I see women clinging on to their pocketbooks when certain, you know, big black guy uh, passes by and I'm like, wow, that big black guy would be the first one to protect you if someone actually tried to mug you. And you're putting him in a position where you're acting like you're afraid of him. What made you decide to be afraid of him unless you're listening to the media rather to your own personal experiences where people are people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so just casting back over the conversations that I might have had with you, Andy, sure. doing my own research. So going back to your dad, I mean, wasn't he connected uh, f like in a friendship way to Andy Warhol? And am I right in saying that you were... Andy Warhol's good, good, good son or good child. Well, <clears throat> he definitely, if something had ever happened to my dad, I definitely would have shown up at Andy's doorstep. And um, my dad used to bring me by the factory often and sometimes even take me out of school for the day claiming I was sick just so I could go with him down to the factory, hang around. I remember one day I, I said to my dad, oh, I don't want to go back over there. It's boring. And he said, well, Nemo, you don't know, maybe Muhammad Ali will be there or maybe, you know, some other celebrity that I liked at the time. And I, I was like, well, OK. And I went over there and you know who I met? I met Santa Claus because he was doing a Santa Claus portrait. And I was still young enough that I half believed that that was Santa Claus and Andy knew him. Yeah. So, yeah, no, my dad uh, came to this town, you know, son of a Sicilian immigrant, um, had 58 cents in his pocket, uh, went to the Art Students League and was working at, I think it was called Fox's Art Supply and on 57th Street. And Andy used to frequent the place when he was a commercial artist. We're going back to the late 50s now, and, uh, or early 60s. And then when Andy started with the soup cans, my dad was already just friends with him. And Andy said, oh, Rick, you know how to hustle. Go out there with one of these soup cans, see what you can get for it. And I think my dad came back with $1,500 and it went on from there. But yeah, Andy, Andy Warhol was a, a, you know, a friend of the family. And uh, I knew him, you know, closely all the way up until his death. And I'm, I'm one of the people I still think of daily. Yeah. The, um, what was he like as an individual? Cause I've, 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 I've watched the Radiant Child and they made it quite clear there was a good connection between Jean-Michel Basquiat and, and Andy Warhol. And they also done some collaborations. And in some respect, it looked like that Andy really admired Jean-Michel Basquiat and kind of brought him under his wing in some respects. That's how the documentary portrayed it. But from someone that knew him and knows street art and the culture, what, what was he like as a person? And was he really that fond of Basquiat? Well, 
I'll try to hit all those points. Um, first of all, Andy had a public persona. Um, and when you got to know him privately, there was a bit of difference, but he really was that sort of Zen master. Like he could come up with a one liner that was perfect Warholism, so to speak. Like you, you'd ask him a, a simple question and the way he'd answer was always such a flip that it, it made your mind tingle. So he was, he was a genius. And, you know, the way he even conducted himself with that whole factory full of people drawing together all these disparate talents and together they just made this beautiful chemistry. And, you know, I've heard people say, oh, well, Gerard Malanga really did this or, or Ronnie Catron really did that. Yes, they were like an orchestra and they came together and each one had something to contribute. But the mastermind was and always will be Andy Warhol. So there's only one name that should have been signed to those things. He's a genius. He's a modern genius. And history won't soon forget about him. Now, as far as when they collaborated, at that time, look, I remember interviewing Andy Warhol for my school newspaper in, I don't know, fourth or fifth grade. And most of the people in my school had never heard of him. Now it would be difficult to find a school full of people that hadn't heard of Andy Warhol. He'd really become like a Rembrandt, Leonardo da Vinci, Andy Warhol. But at the time during the early mid 80s, uh, I wouldn't say Andy had fallen from grace, but he wasn't the ginormous celebrity that he had been throughout the 60s and early 70s. So Jean was a very quickly rising star. And it wasn't just Andy that admired him. You just met the guy and he, I wouldn't have called him a child, but he was definitely radiant. And I'm actually not so pleased, even though Rene Ricard is my respected elder, I would have never called, you know, I think Jean-Michel was 21 or 22 when he made it and 27 when he died. At no point would I call a person of that age a child. Um, but that said, he was radiant and everybody that met him was charmed by him. There was just something about the guy. So unfortunately, I see this ne next generation of young artists that might twist their hair up to look like that or wear a scruffy shirt with a suit to look like him. Oh, I'm the next Basquiat. No, be the first something else. You'll never be the next Basquiat. He was such a particular pedigree of individual. He, he'll never be duplicated. But at the point when he teamed up with Andy, you could say Andy was looking for the new hip thing, the new relevance. And the friendship was in every regard in earnest on both parts, I think. Andy'd been down that track before and mentored John on what he could expect from the art world as an insider. And John showed him his raw new breed of, um, you know, John had a perfectly I don't care-ish attitude that translates into his work where, uh, I think the Italian term for it is sprezzatura, where it's a studied nonchalance. It's a carelessness that makes the, the Basquiat's sing. It, it's his read of poetry. Whereas you could say Andy was always fairly careful in his conception. So I think that they, they were a sort of yin and yang friendship that was really beautiful and fruitful on both sides. Yeah. I really like the way you articulated that. So there, there isn't too much of the connection maybe directly with Andy Warhol and Richard Hamilton. Um, do you know any stories or did they ever cross each other's paths or was Hamilton so caught up or so in his own rhythm and his own groove, he just didn't really, excuse my friends, give a shit really about anybody else? I, you know, I never saw Richard as a joiner. Right from the beginning, he just sort of carved a niche for himself. And you could say that there was a great respect between him and Jean-Michel. Um, and even early on, I know him and Rene Ricard were close, but he wasn't part of the scene. He wasn't always at the club mm -hmm. with the right girl. I think Richard was a little bit of a, a hermit. And, and, you know, I think he definitely would have admired Warhol and uh, you know, Gorky and, and uh, de Kooning and all the artists who, Rauschenberg. But I think he knew very well in his heart that he was going to create something of his own and he wasn't looking to fill anybody else's shoes. Yeah. We um, 
Because the only real collaboration I've ever really been aware of with Hamilton is the LA2 pieces. Um, we've actually had a few here, the, the Shadowheads, which are really cool with the, you know, the squiggles on the outside. It brings the Shadowheads a bit more to life. They're really, really cool. But bar that, I, I don't really know too, too much, too many others. No, and occasionally, I mean, I've definitely seen it with my own eyes. And I know Hank O'Neill captured one in a photograph where um, Jean-Michel would um, draw a face on a shadow man. But I think that was something done in layers. Like Richard had painted the silhouette and then Jean-Michel might have walked by it with his paint, uh, his uh, oil stick and drew the face on top of it. And I also skull, yeah. recently... Huh? It was the skull, the Jean-Michel Basquiat skull. And like you quite... Exactly quite, right. As you pointed out there, the LA2 one was an actual collaboration, whereas that exactly. was... Exactly. Basquiat was going over the top. And am I right in saying that you should do that to get recognition because he wasn't as recognised as Hamilton back then? Who, who, LA2? No, Basquiat, the skulls over the shadow figures. Oh, no, Basquiat at that time, I think that was just a dialogue. That was, you know, I don't know if at that point that was him looking for attention. I mean, for instance, there is another graffiti artist named um, O.E., Old English, uh, an outlaw duo called O.E. and P13. And recently I saw Richard Hamilton that was sort of collaborated with by O.E. Now, O.E. could give a shit about the art world, but he saw Richard as kind of part of our story. Same way we would write on a wall, we would write uh, in collaboration with another fellow artist that saw these public walls as their showcase for their expression. So I think probably if you went back in time, you'd probably find any number of people that sort of uh, dialogued with the Hamilton shadows when they saw them. I don't know if they were calling out for attention or because at that time when Richard was doing the silhouettes, at least on the, the shadow men on the first round, we didn't even know he was a famous artist. It was an altogether different life. It was how he interacted with the streets. Yeah. You're, you're, look, um, I know this is quite raw still because your, your, your father just passed away recently and my thoughts and feelings goes out to you and your family. Um, you know, re reading about him, I I'm gutted that I never actually got to meet him because he would have been a fantastic person to interview. But what, what, yeah. one thing that I got some secondhand sort of information f uh, from um, a guy called Aaron, um, who owns a clothing company over here called Dark Circle Clothing. And yeah, I we think know. He yeah, we over, know. He went over to New York um, along with a guy called John Russo, um, who's who was yeah. very much a part of... Um, uh, you know, bringing together the Richard Hamilton IP and the archive and foundation for Andy, et cetera. And yeah, he's a fan. Yeah, he's a cool guy. He's someone that I definitely respect. And, uh, you know, I've, I've done mm -hmm. some projects with him in, in the past. Um, Aaron said to me that, you know, Rick was a very smart man, not just from a commercial point of view and from a business point of view, but also on the streets. He would be one of the rare people that could walk into uh, an investment bank and people would recognize who he was and respect him and he could hold his own and then he'll go past maybe you know a quite a checkered kind of street where there could be some gangs and there could quite clearly maybe some underhand in dealing going on and he would get a bit of a nod from these people was he really that mm -hmm. respected your father you know really had that kind of aura about him that people admired him absolutely uh a friend of mine i, I worked with the crips and bloods in la so you're talking about a guy who'd never met my dad, but uh, one of the elder statesmen of the, the Bloods from L.A. came out here and he met my dad and he was calling my dad OG, OG. And, and my dad pulled me aside. He said, why does he keep calling me OG? I said, that means original gangster. And my dad said, oh, OK, OK. But yeah, I think my dad had this thing uh, where people recognized at once that he's somebody who, if you went into an alley with him and you tried to, take him out, it was going to be you or him. He wasn't going to go down quietly. And I think that that's the same sort of thing that I, I discussed earlier. You had to recognize in yourself in those early days in New York where there were always marauding bands of gangs trying to take anything from you that they could. You had to learn how to stand up for yourself. And my dad very much learned that at an early age when he moved to New York. I think he was 18 or 19. He was on his own here. so. 
But at the same time, I would go with them to Christie's sometimes for the big auctions. And, you know, I'd dress up. I'd wear a suit or whatever. He'd wear some khaki pants with stains on them and an old shirt. And I'd say, Dad, what are you doing? You know, you look crazy. He'd say, don't worry about it. Then we'd go in there and people would be like, oh, do you want a seat? You want a seat in the front? He's like, no, no, I'm going to stand in the back. I said, what are you? He always wanted to be low profile in those places. He didn't want people looking at him and bidding after him and watching what he was doing. He just wanted to sort of play the background. So that I think was not only smart, I think it was genius is that he always stayed under the radar. And he said, Nemo, in my day, art, art dealers kept a low profile. So I think he was able to, I wouldn't even say he inhabited both worlds. It was all one big world to him, whether he walked the street corners or whether he walked into our finer institutions, he, he stayed the same person throughout. How did he find himself into the art market and, and becoming such a recognized figure there? Because, um, uh, again, you know, just listening to him, maybe I'm, I'm stereotyping here, but I, he doesn't come across like a typical person. But then at the same time, I, I'm not. I'm not from the art market, but I found myself being pulled into this world because I'm so enthusiastic about hearing the stories learning the culture the reasons why these artists do what they do and i'm just kind of pumped by the whole entire thing so is that what right. your dad actually lived there this is the difference i'm from london you know i'm here at, in in soho but yeah is it is it because he was just in in that environment and it was organic he become an art dealer well what it was is that when he moved to new york initially it was to participate in the dialogue of culture because I think he saw the uh, the homely Protestant by Motherwell in a Life magazine or something, and he just he said, "I want to be part of this. I want to go to the Cedar Tavern. I want to meet Franz Klein. I want to sit with the Kooning. All things that he ended up doing. Um, he was studying art. He was always making art himself. All to the end, he was always making art and writing poetry. Um, it was very early on. I mean. God, he, he didn't go to the sixth grade in school. He, he could barely spell, honestly. Um, and then he got kicked out of the military. So he had nowhere to turn, but the art world was a place where he fit in naturally because if he didn't know something about art, well, he'd go and find it out. And he didn't need a professor or somebody to pull his coat either. He would go and read books this thick about uh, Cubism and what how Cubism came to be. or he read he was an autodidact and he taught himself everything under the sun about art he might not know about every subject that they teach you in college but he could have taught in a course on art history because he knew everything about the first petroglyphs the first hieroglyphs in egypt how they built the pyramids to the renaissance to all the way to today and that was something that couldn't be denied so he definitely came up against the guy who got his mfa in in Princeton or Harvard, and he was able to hold his own in a conversation with anybody because he'd done the grunt work of learning about all those things for sure. That's good. That's really, really oh, great wait. stuff. I'm, I'm sorry. I should probably uh, address your other question, which, and then I, I think I, I started to explain that it was through his friendship with Andy Warhol, and then he became uh, close with. Um, Walter Chrysler, that was the son of the Chrysler family, who was a collector and a curator, and an older gentleman who had all the old world mm -hmm. manners. And he took my dad and he said, look, why are you wearing this army jacket? You got to go into Brooks Brothers and buy a suit, and et cetera. And he put that last kind of spit and polish on my dad, which enabled him to make a living for himself from that point on. But it was really his, his tireless curiosity and expertise that that was able to that's how he really cut his teeth in that business we um we recently this year acquired a um original canvas rodeo marlboro man uh, richard hamilton original which is black and white with a little bit of pink in it and what's very unique about it is the lasso if you look at it it's like a heart shape you might be familiar with it um i'm going to ask you a bit more about that particular piece and maybe, you know, a bit more about the reason why your dad collected Hamilton, but y your dad must have collected a lot of great artists. So which artists did he collect and which artists did he, did he deal for? Well, 
I think it was Walter Chrysler that taught my dad the basic tenet of, uh, of business, which is to buy cheap and sell dear. So any time he saw an artist distressed, he, he first of all recognized him with compassion as a human being, because my dad is the type of person that would literally give someone the shirt off his back or couldn't stand to see somebody without a hot meal. So uh, if he saw an artist that had been, you know, doing well hitherto, and then suddenly, you know, on the skids, he would just naturally want to tr- make, make that right. And in so doing, it ended up being a business, but that wasn't, I don't believe, my dad's intention all along. It wasn't through being calculated that my dad, so for instance, when my dad met Tom Wesselman, he said, Tom Wesselman at the time didn't want to have retrospectives at the Whitney or the Guggenheim. He just didn't want big books done in his name, et cetera. So certain things that you would think any artist would be eager and chomping at the bit to do, Wesselman was very cool about. He was, he was more bohemian in his outlook. But yet Liechtenstein and Warhol were readily recognized as the forerunners of pop art. But uh, Wesselman had been there every bit as much as those other two in forming, forming this new great American movement. So my father wanted to just sort of help set things right with Wesselman. So for many years, he got involved with Wesselman and was bringing people to the studio. I believe he brought Andy Valmorbida to the studio at that time. But at some point after Wesselman passed and his estate did a deal with a major gallery, my father wasn't given that backdoor access anymore. He backed out of it. it. And then at that time, he was also dealing with Richard. It, or recently, you know, um, uh, Vito Schnabel had a prolonged involvement with the Bruce High Quality Foundation. And when they stopped dealing together, my father and I started going in there and selling pictures out of their studio because we said, naturally, you know, uh, these people have a rightful place in the canon of art history. And if, if not, no one else is there at the moment, we'll step in and fill that void. So that, mm. that was his natural inclination, but it also looks as if it was business acumen, which I don't think that was the motivating principle there. I mean, it ends up being a advantageous position for business, but it was more about being about art and being there for other artists. Yeah. I've been around a lot of Hamilton pieces quite naturally. We've got hundreds of works under management. We have a lot of collectors, investors, and sheer fanatics buying and selling all the time. And when we we are basically just focused on Hamilton for this present point in time, there are other projects coming up, including out Diaz and a few others. Uh, but unlike right. a typical gallery that would jump from one genre to the next, one medium to the next, one you know one artist to the next, we want to stay in that. I keep on referring to it is that ecosystem. We want to tell the story. We want to become right. as close as we can be to like experts in, in this field. Anyway, the, the piece that we, that your father used to own, this is this Marlborough uh, man. Um, it's one of the best ones I've ever seen. I mean, for me, I have seen a lot of good rodeo from really good years. Like I sold one uh, a few years back from 1985. It was, featured in the Shadow Man documentary. It's black and white. It was beautiful. And I sold it to a, a fairly big client of ours. But when I got this one uh, from, from the States and it was owned by your dad, what I loved about it, it was one, the pink I- I- in the canvas, but also the lasso, because Hamilton used to do these shadow hearts as well. And it resembled yeah. this, this heart. Are you familiar with the actual work that I'm referring to? And um, also- No, but it makes sense to me, Steve. I mean, I, I've heard from elsewhere that he 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 borrowed that heart motif from um, Jim Dine, but he gave it an edge. And I, I've seen that happen again and again with Richard, where he would work with one motif and work with another motif separately, and at some point they would sort of fuse together into one image. So that would be a perfect uh, Hamiltonism to suddenly turn the lasso into a heart, because also. Richard, right up to the end, was an incurable romantic. And he was, he was a lover boy. And um, I think he probably felt as though that lasso that's always going to catch you is, is love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe. Um, 
let's just talk about quickly the financial side mm-hmm. of the art market, street art graffiti. Sure. There's probably two names that when I think about, or three quite naturally, when I think about street art, I'm obviously thinking about Hamilton because it's something I'm immersed in and something I really love and passionate about. But when we're talking about big hitting figures, I'm thinking about Jean-Michel Basquiat, $110.5 million in 2017. I think that same piece was sold in 1984 for $19,000. Uh, which was a massive jump. And then I'm thinking about someone who's a bit more closer to home to me, which is Richard Hamilton's precursor, which is which is Banksy. And I watched a documentary called Banksy and the Rise of Outlaw Art recently. And I interviewed two guys in the last two weeks who were narrators on there. One was Ben Iron, and also one was uh, Alan Ketz. And Alan Ketz one comes, at, comes out actually tomorrow. And I found Alan Ketz, like, just like you, so knowledgeable about your area of expertise and so immersed and so passionate. Anyway, Banksy's obviously hit some massive figures. He's someone that is still alive, doesn't look like he's going to pop his clogs anytime soon. But then you've got Jean-Michel Basquiat. His market is thriving as well and keeps on going up. Do you think that can, that can continue? Is it going to keep on going up? And also, do you think Richard Hamilton has the same opportunity as far as appreciation his market compound in over the next five Clearly, to 15 yeah. years yes um first of all i don't know about things keep on going up because at some point you could buy a rembrandt for the same amount that you could buy a basquiat and um i think that <clears throat> look i remember being in the fun gallery full of basquiats they were twelve hundred dollars and patty Astor looked at me and said nemo nobody's buying them so people that today, they're like, oh, I want to own a basket. I was like, where were you 30 years ago when nobody wanted to buy them? And part of that is, uh, I would say that Julian Schnabel's classic film, Basquiat, is partly to thank for that. Because I watched uh, Basquiat's go from $50,000 to $5 million. After that, they went from $50 million to $500 million. It's, it's crazy. But I think that Richard uh, Hamilton market is every bit as much going to follow suit. And a, another one you didn't mention, um, and it's funny that a lot of people don't mention, somehow is not brought into this dialogue, is Martin Wong, or even David Vonarovich for that matter. But Martin Wong was my, I think he was my favorite artist growing up, and still is. And it's a shame, you know, I wasn't able to afford them when I was 18. And now I don't, I don't know if I can afford it again because the market keeps recognizing how great Martin Wong was. But he was there on the street and everyone knew him as well. And in, in, I, w- I would put him up there in, in that pantheon readily, as, as well as David Vonarovich. But that said, um, Richard Hamilton, look, he shot himself in the foot as a businessman because he was always happy just to pay his rent have his girlfriend or two girlfriends living with him and have his little snack area and have his studio and whatever uh, he liked to inebriate himself with on hand. He was happy if he just had his immediate needs seen to. So he never played the game of cozying up with, I don't know, Pace Gallery and becoming part of the stable of artists. And had he done that and had he been recognized at auction from an early age, there's no doubt in my mind he would have been up there with a basket price-wise today. Is he going there now? I think so with a bullet. I think he's just been going up and up and up. And I think that the public um, perception of him is good, but it's getting better. There's still people I talk to today that I say Richard Hamilton and they go, oh, Richard Hamilton, the, the British pop artist? I say, no, Richard Hamilton, the guy who had shadow men all over this city he's part of our culture he's part of our tradition and you don't even know who the hell i'm talking about but that's changing and look i watched it happen to warhol in my lifetime i watched him become a household name and i watched jean michel um you know it's also to richard's detriment that he outlived his direct contemporaries that they died young and beautiful and he turned into this crazy man with a hunchback and a bandage on his face but it's it's part of a myth that will endure in time 
And I think that he will be recognized by the marketplace and already has started to be. And, and you guys have been very helpful to that end as well as from the beginning, Andy Valmorbida has too. How do you think Richard felt? Um, Cause I've asked this to Andy, but I wanted to get your take, you know, like being his, his, his career almost got resurrected, you know, thanks to Andy and Vladimir and a few other key others. And, you know, he was probably, I don't know, and I'm just stereotyping or even guessing here, but like you said, probably just paying his rent, uh, just getting by, doing drugs, you know, living a bit of a controversial life, and then suddenly going round the world, five different major cities with Giorgio Armani. I mean, that that is just like crazy different, crazy different extremes, isn't it? Yeah, except that I don't think it registered much with him. I think he he had his, I think he had his regimen, and I think he had his comfort zone. And you'll notice his his art went on tour around the world, but he did not. And I don't think he cared to. I mean, for instance, when he had the show at Phillips uh, with Andy, uh, and I, I think Armani was behind that as well. We had to go and get Richard from his studio. He didn't want to attend. Now, it could partly be because he had his face bandaged and he kind of lost his movie star good looks. I don't know if it was vanity or just he was home painting and that's what he liked to do best. I think uh, your guy over there, Francis Bacon was a bit like that. He would do the mu the museum opening, but he liked to be in the studio in a pair of old trousers with a, a bottle of scotch. That was where he was happy. And I have to say, I repeat this story a lot, but in one of his last moments, I'd opened a cafe and I wanted Richard to come paint something at the cafe. And I mean, he looked like he would keel over at any moment. It was weeks before he, he actually passed. And I went to pick him up from his, his hotel room. And as we walked down the street, Steve, he was clutching my shoulder and wheezing. And I said, man, as much as I want this guy to paint for me, I'm not going to be responsible for his demise. So I said, Richard, you know what? Maybe today's not the day. Let's turn back. You could lay down and I'll try again tomorrow. And he said, no. I want to paint. And I mean, that motherfucker gave, it gave me the chills just thinking about it right now. I mean, that's all he wanted in life, Steve. So I think he was pleased that we all accept it. I think he was pleased that movie stars were buying it and that Mr. Armani and Andy Valmorbida were making a big fuss about his artwork. But I think the important thing for him was to always be making art and always be digging into his endless store of creativity that kept him moving forward. There's something really authentic about how you talk about Hamilton and it's just such a lovely thing to see, witness and hear, and it's, it's just great. Uh, how did you, how did you get, how did you play a part in the Richard Hamilton Shadow Man documentary? And, and also um, how did you feel when it won an award at the Tribeca Film Festival? That's a pretty big deal. Yeah. I mean, uh, part of it, honestly just seems par for the course for me you know I, I think there should be you know like Billy the Kid there's 50 movies about Billy the Kid and one he's played by Jimmy Stewart one he's played by Paul Newman and I think it, Richard gives us enough raw material to reflect on that there should be a hundred documentaries about it now there's starting to be actually several about Jean-Michel right there's I think three documentaries I know of and two other films that he figures into um, I thought that they did a great job on the Shadow Man documentary. I, w I was obviously pleased to be a part of it, but it wouldn't surprise me that it would win an award because, you know, you're talking a very skilled team of filmmakers with great raw material. You know, where could you go wrong? Yeah. Your uh, personal favorite then out of the landscapes, the beautiful works, the shadow figures, the rodeos, I mean, what, what have you ever collected? What have you collected from him? And what, what would you say is your favorite? Well, at the, time, at the time, um, Richard really wanted to get the beautiful series off the ground. So sort of put me in command of just selling those for him exclusively. And I'm shocked that, you know, the prices for a rodeo versus the prices for 
a beautiful series. Though, between you and me, uh, during his lifetime, Andy Warhol couldn't sell the skulls, couldn't sell the electric chairs, couldn't sell the car crashes. And these are things which have appreciated and value since. I think somebody's going to get smart and they'll have a, I, actually, um, what are they called? I'm sorry. I feel terrible. I can't think, uh, uh, would, um, the, the gallery that was showing him here in New York. Woodward. Woodward's did an excellent show of his beautiful series and they put bouquets of flowers in between. And I thought it was a very touching little, um, sort of shrine to his work in his own lifetime. I think the beautiful series also, because they look, well, what Richard said to me anyway, I don't know if he's quoted as saying this, but he said, I like the beautiful series because they're modeled after those paintings that are in the background of people's homes in movies. If you see a movie or a TV show, there's always this sort of misty uh, sea landscape in the background. So he tried to replicate that with all these weird resins. Um, I'd also reflect that it looks like blood going into a syringe as well. So it, that murky kind of um, Albert Pinkham Ryder moody um, darkness, it, I, I find them very beautiful. So I would really stand, especially because I always root for the underdog, the beautiful series, I, I kind of have a special place in my heart. But also you look at the rodeo series, I mean, I understand why these are at such a premium right now. Because what is Richard other than the perfect American cowboy? And, and you know, he's such a renegade and um, he is the Marlboro man. Um, and then of course, there's those standing shadows that are like the first things that introduced me to his world. And you still find some of them on the streets today. So I don't know, I, I'm a big fan of Hamilton, even though I've been exposed to his stuff and I knew him very well. I, I still, you know, I still see things to, like flipping through catalogs today. I'll see things I've never seen before. And they shock me as if I've never seen his work before. I've had, um, uh, strangely enough, quite a lot of requests recently, uh, which is, seems like it's come out of the blue, of his blood works, literally landscapes yeah. that he's made from his own blood and sometimes the flowers. And they have surprisingly yeah, the been jumping up in value. I mean, look, they've not gone to hundreds of thousands of pounds you know or, or the millions but they, they are creeping up and um it's it, it's funny as you just said andy warhol had a series of different artworks that found it very very difficult to sell including jean michel yep. basket very difficult to sell and then later on in life people got smart people got wise and they started jumping up um yeah blood works i mean what's your what's your take on those well i'll quote picasso to say you know people think it's important it's expensive that they've paid a million dollars for a Picasso painting, but they don't understand they have a vial of my blood. And I think that it was such a, a struggle for Picasso to create a painting as it was with Richard. I can't tell you when I first started bringing Vlad and Andy by Richard's studio, sometimes I remember Vladimir one time pointed at a painting and said, oh, I want that one, pointing at one of the beautiful series. To me, it was a magnificent example of a beautiful painting. And um, Richard looks at it and he goes, no, no, I'm not, I'm not happy with that one. I'm not ready with that one yet. Vladimir said, well, I'll give you 10 grand right now and walk out with it. And Richard said, yeah, hold on, come see me next week. And we went next week and it was all scraped off. And he started it over again. He, he, he wasn't too quick to call something finished or to be satisfied with something. So, um, wait, I forgot your original question was. Well, it, was the, it was the blood series. Right. And so, he was making landscapes out of them. Exactly, so he also did these works with blood. He did landscapes with blood. He did some beautiful ones that I, I believe Andy bought. They were um, blood on gold. And, um, I, just mixing those two elements, it's just got this sort of alchemical uh, archetypal meaning to us, working with blood and gold. But uh, I think that w what could be more intimate than to see something painted with the artist's own blood? I'll give you a quick uh, story. Um, at some point, Martin Wong, who I said is one of my favorite artists, 
was in Bellevue Hospital. I think he'd gone on a bad acid trip and woke up in Bellevue. And he said, Nemo, uh, my, my gums were bleeding so bad that I started wiping them off on the pillowcase. And then when I looked at it, it had made a sort of painterly mark. He said, so I kept at it all night. And he said, I made a head of Christ on this pillowcase out of my own blood. And he said, and in the morning when the orderlies came to bring me breakfast, I placed the pillowcase over my face like a shroud. He said, the orderly came in, he took the pillowcase, threw it in the laundry and gave him his breakfast and walked out. Years later, Martin Wong was at a gathering for the squat theater or something and met some nice guy who turned out worked at Bellevue. And uh, Martin Wong said, oh, I was in Bellevue years ago and told him this story. He said, are you kidding? He said, we had that head of Christ in the basement as a shrine. So oh, wow. I think, yeah. So I, I think to work with artists on blood, it's, 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 it's such an archetypal sort of primitive move on the artist. It's like the first artist putting their handprints on a cave wall or something. So yeah, I have a few blood works by Richard myself and I wouldn't sell them for all the tea in China. <laughs> um, just want to ask you a couple more things. I'm going to wrap up the podcast. So um, sure. we've been in, in this space since 2014, as in the street art sector and Hambleton, and we've definitely seen it grow. I remember selling Shadowhead for like two, three, four K and now they're selling, you know, yeah. 40, 50, 60, 70. I've even seen one gallery, which I think is quite on the expensive side. I won't name who they are, but they're selling Shadowhead for up to a hundred grand, which is like, wow. Right. It just proves to you that the market is jumping up. Now, part of the reason why I think this is happening is because of what happened last year, which was the, the start and birth of coronavirus. And many economies around the world were forced into um, restrictions, lockdown, isolation, etc. And what that meant is it was a knock-on effect. It, me it meant that the economy wasn't booming, unemployment was going up, tax hikes were being introduced, and it meant that your more conventional areas from banks, pensions, ISIS bonds, stocks and shares, you name it, were being decimated and being affected. So what smart people start realising that if they can put their money into passion assets or into assets which were going to weather the storm of coronavirus, they weren't only going to protect their money, but they were going to yield a really good return. Have you been experiencing the same kind of stuff? I mean, are people still trading up from where you're living right now? Um, how have you seen the market shape since coronavirus has been launched into our lives? Well, smart people always buy gold always buy real estate and always buy art to diversify from my experience. I'm, I've never studied business a day in my life, but this has been my empirical findings. And I think that lately there's been a lot of sort of flash in the pan, sort of like dot com ideas of new business models mm. that have come along. I think when somebody has got a moment to reflect, First of all, when you collect art, if it never appreciates in value, if it goes down in value, you still got something beautiful hanging on your wall. Right. I have relationship with certain artworks on my walls right now that aren't worth two cents and they're hanging right next to a very important artworks. So in that regard, who, why would you wanna collect a stock or a bond that's just a blip on your screen when you might see the same growth out of something beautiful. See, my strategy is always, I buy all the new artists across the boards. Any new artist that, that tickles my fancy, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna buy something from the person. Say I, I have a budget, I'm gonna buy five things at 10 grand each. It always happens that one of them becomes a breakout star and pays for the lot of them and then some and sends my kids to college. But then it's also, I've got nine other artworks that I picked with my own hand that I appreciate, that I, I personally value, whether they're a value to anybody else. So I think during the coronavirus times, I think people got back to what really matters. And I think art will always mean a lot to people. And people lose sight of that when they're tangling with the latest trends of the business world. But I think art will always be here. 
this this actually is a perfect opportunity to ask the almost one of the most final parts of this conversation. So, what is it you're actually doing right now, Nemo? Is it is it still art dealing? You you are clearly still in that market. You you said you're investing into these artists that you believe are going to become the next rising star and household name. Is that all you do, or are you doing other stuff as well? Well, I, again, I collect art as a passion. And, you know, my art, I, I have art hung on every possible wall space of my house, but I also have books over flooding my bookshelves where now I'm going to have to get storage just for my book collection. Um, like I said, Steve, I'm, I'm just sort of a bohemian. So when I collect art, it's not even necessarily uh, the business side of me that's activated. It's just because I love it. I go to an art opening. I see something. I don't want to spend any money. I go home. I'm still thinking about that damn artwork. I don't know if it's going to go up in value. Honestly, I don't have a crystal ball, but I end up calling the gallery the next day. And I say, look, you know, put that one on hold for me because I'm a sucker for art. And, um, but what do I do? I mean, like for instance, I used to create, uh, I used to make radio shows for 10 years. And then I, I used to make soundtracks for hotels and restaurants. And recently, Tom Sachs, that used to be a fan of my radio shows, has designed a radio with two channels, one with all classical music and one that's going to have all music that I've curated. So I work tirelessly on this thing. You know, every odd hour I'm up making music for Tom Sachs. It's not even a business deal between him and me. It's just as my buddy, I believe in what he does. I'm a big fan of Tom Sachs' work. So... I'm making music in collaboration with his. So, you know, if I met a ballet troupe today and I love what they were doing and they were like, oh, we're flying to Moscow tomorrow, I might fly with them and go watch their premiere in Moscow. I'm just, I, I, get, I get moved by art. And to tell you the truth, when I met Andy, you know, here's a, a rich playboy that's dating Paris Hilton and, you know, he's always on the scene with all the right people and a little bit different from the way I, I carry myself. But the thing that made me fall in love with him, I'm bromance, right? And a bromance was he was telling me he was over at the Wildenstein house and walked into a wrong room. And, and he was looking for the restroom and he opened the door and he said there was a Van Gogh in the room. And he said, Nemo, it just drew me to it. And I was just standing in front of that Van Gogh. I couldn't believe my eyes. And I don't think he was saying because it was a Van Gogh, because it was a rare artwork, because it was valuable, because whatever umph whatever passion that van gogh put into that it, it drew andy magnetically and that's the same draw i feel I, myself from creativity and art so i just constantly surround myself in art whether it's as a business or as a passion or in my leisure time i always find myself sort of revolving around the art's orbit that's good stuff well, look, um, I've taken up a lot of your time. You give me some very, very valuable insight to New York and the art market and also some of, you know, some of the cool stories that you come out with. Uh, Nemo, if you want people to follow your journey, Instagram, Facebook, or any projects that you've got, where can they find you? I'm just not that modern, Steve. I'm, I'm, you know, I wish I could say, oh, look, my Instagram is like the most private thing in the world. I've got about 2,500 followers, they're all people I know that, that want to see pictures of my dad or my son off to school. I'm not like, hey, I'm flying in this private jet to this island today, or I'm eating at this restaurant. I, I just haven't caught up with the modern world like that. So if, if people want to keep up with me, maybe we'll run into each other one day and we can walk through a museum together, something you know more intimate like that. I, I guess I'm still kind of I don't value my privacy, but I still haven't quite broken out of my private realm. Okay, fair enough. Um, well, look, we are looking to get over to the States, New York, when we can. Obviously, the restrictions and corona, etc., cetera, it, it delayed that. But no doubt we'll be over there. I'm definitely going to hit you up. Maybe we could do a part, part two. You could show me around some of the cool, oh. cool sites. And also, I would like to pick, pick your brain about who else to look out for in the future, you know, who I should be investing my money into. And, um, you know, just, just give me a bit of uh, an authentic walk around New York. I think that would be great. Well, 
I'll well, tell you right, I'll tell you right now, now, and anybody who's listening to, to the guy that, the guy that I try, I try to buy things from, things from anytime, anytime he gives me an opportunity, me an opportunity Baha, Baha Arslanian. Uh, uh, just look him just up. Look I'm, him not up. Sure I'm not even sure if he's showing with a gallery now or what. The Baha Arslanian is my favorite artist at the moment. I've got about five on my walls right now. So, Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. V A H A K A K N Arslanian A R S L A N I A N. He's a very special, a very special person, person and a great, and a great artist. Good stuff. Okay, good stuff. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's one more question. When I mm. came up with my podcast, um, when I started running my own business, a sales company, Sales is all about mindset. It's all about um, what you think about, you attract, you know, the effort you put in, you know, you're going to get the rewards, etc. So my slogan is this, be happy, never content. If I were to ask Nemo Labrizi, what does be happy, never content mean to you? Well, I guess the same way I believe in joy. I would call it joy, you know. I, sometimes people see me and they say, oh, you look depressed. What's the matter? I say, no, I feel joy inside. So I think it's, it's similar to your credo. I, I, I have a certain sense of joy and I feel lucky just to be alive. You know, just that I woke up this morning and I'm free to do whatever the hell I want with my day. That's a joy. You know, it, it, life is a gift. You know, but being content, I feel like you start being content, you're dead in the water. You know, like, hey, I'm really somebody, I've accomplished something in life. No, you haven't begun. Like Monet's last words were, and I was beginning to show promise. After taking the art world by storm for 90 years, he, he felt he was just beginning. So I think that's what it means to be happy and not content. Good stuff. This is going to be out in a few weeks, Nemo. Obviously, people listening to this right now are, are, have just finished the podcast. So thank you very much for your time. I'm definitely going to stay in communication. Offline, Emo, I'll WhatsApp you, send you some voice notes about Hambletons and maybe, you know, like some other artwork because I'm, I'm looking to build my own collection still. So is yep. the company. Um, and let's definitely stay, keep this dialogue up. All right? Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and your energy and everything that you do. Thank you, you too. Likewise, you're, you're an absolute star, mate. Cheers. <laughs> Take Bye. care. Bye-bye.